Hi, welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I'm the state government reporter at the Spokesman Review. I'm joined here today by Pete Serrano, a Republican running for Attorney General. Serrano is also the mayor of the city of Pasco. Pete, thanks so much for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me today. It's always my pleasure to talk. Um, yeah, so I guess my first question for you is, why don't you give us your pitch? Why are you running and why should people vote for you? Yeah, I, I decided to run because I want to make sure that Washington is a safe place to live for the general public. Um, I've talked about this often on the campaign trail, uh, being the mayor of Pasco, having been on city council for the past six, almost seven years, we've seen some of the most immense amount of growth. And during that time, we've managed to, uh, we've successfully managed our housing inventory. We've helped reduce homeless population. Uh, we're actually making the streets safer. And so when I look at that, you know, we're now a city of 80,000. We're not Little Pasco anymore. And I think that's something that's desperately missing is that local government feel from Olympia. Um, you know, I think folks get up there and they lose their touch with their roots. And I want to bring that back. And again, focusing on safety and transparency of government. And those are going to be really the two critical elements and obviously leading with constitutional analysis when we advise our clients. And I think those are some kind of ripe activities for that agency. Okay. You mentioned leading with constitutional analysis. Could you talk a little bit about what that means to you and how it would impact your leadership of the Attorney General's office? Yeah, you know, one thing I've seen, and maybe this is, you know, casual ob casual observation or the outsider's view, it seems to me that politics often is in play at the Attorney General's office. We look at what happened with the chicken and tuna checks, and while that was beneficial to the public, the way it rolled out really just felt like it was more of about Bob than the win. Um, and so when it comes down to how we advise agencies, we see tremendous agency overreach. Uh, we, I've seen it in my practice in the Washington Medical Commission and the way they've aggressively pursued licensing issues. I've seen it back to housing with Department of Ecology, Labor and Industries. I've seen uh, Liquor Cannabis Board take some roles that it really shouldn't be authorized to do. And if those agencies are acting on their own, they're not getting that advice. I mean, again, they're either rogue actors and that needs to be brought back in. And the place to do so, I believe, is the attorney general's office or they're not getting good advice from the attorney general's office that should lead with the Constitution and say, hey, your box of your agencies this far, you're now an extra foot outside of that box. Let's let's call you back into where you should be. Yeah. You mentioned the Liquor and Cannabis Board kind of acting out of turn. Can you think of any specific examples of things you've seen recently that would raise a red flag if you were attorney general? Yeah. You know, when I was uh, before I had decided to run for uh, attorney general early in the pandemic, the Liquor Cannabis Board actually proposed a rule, a permanent rule that would allow it to enforce any future gubernatorial, gubernatorial proclamation. So obviously during the pandemic, they were enforcing mask mandates and other things about the safe shutdown uh, through the governor's uh, proclamations. But this one just, it, it broadly said, any governor's proclamation will have enforcement authority on. And I don't see that as liquor cannabis boards, you know, really their purview, right? It's, it's are you over serving? Are you serving minors? You should be out there testing purity of alcohol, making sure people aren't getting sick, right? Uh, not whether or not the governor today declares a disaster because of a mudslide. I mean, does LCB then tell people in the mudslide that they're not doing the right thing? Again, if it has to do with liquor or cannabis, let's address that and regulate it through that agency but not just generically saying, hey, we're going to enforce these proclamations. And so we actually challenged that, and they would they withdrew the rule. Mm. Okay. Um, in your eyes, what is the state's most significant safety problem? I mean, certainly the fentanyl and drug addiction is, is tremendously leading the cause as to what we're seeing when we walk down the streets. It's causing secondary issues like, you know, the low-level property crime individuals that are stealing, whether it's your catalytic converter or breaking into your car and stealing from that. And so I think the kind of root cause here is, I mean, there are several root causes that play into the, the drug abuse situation and substance abuse. It could be natural mental health issues that were never treated. It could be bad uh, living situations that fundamentally cause people to turn to drugs. And so I think 
you know, the crisis that we're seeing with fentanyl running rampant. Obviously, we see it in Spokane. We see it in Seattle. We see it everywhere. And it comes up, gets trafficked, uh, you know, not only up and down our south and north borders, but through our ports as well. And so there's going to be a lot of opportunity for the attorney general to roll in and work with federal and state agencies, local agencies, local police authorities to really help, you know, limit that trafficking and where possible work with the legislature on maybe opportunities to, you know, heighten, <clears throat> heighten criminalization of, uh, you know, distribution and, and possession of fentanyl. <laughs> okay. Um, what would you do to make Washington safer during your first term? Yeah, I think, you know, again, it, you know, obviously that's that's going to be number one um, is focusing on how do we actually in, enforce laws? How do we maybe bring more robust, whether it's, again, working with the legislature on on some of the possessions, some of the distribution? I, I talked with a gentleman this afternoon who had a 21 month old niece who consumed fentanyl and died. And he was told that by the prosecuting attorney um, down in that area that she could only bring manslaughter charges to his sister who was with the child. And, you know, there's a certain question of, of, and there's obviously more facts to it. It's his story to tell, and I'm hopeful. I know he has told it. I hope that he will continue to tell it. Uh, But it's a concern when you have people who are endangering others and there's no tooth there's no tools to provide real teeth to again i'm not mr throw the slammer throw the book at him but we need to make sure that people are held accountable and so i think the first thing is making sure that there are tools there for our prosecuting attorneys to actually make people realize that hey if you're going to distribute this and someone's going to be harmed from it you're going to be held accountable for what happens to that individual whether it's your child or whether you're selling it on the street or whatever the case is do you think that there should be more police officers in Washington state? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we rank 51 out of the 50 states plus D.C. on the per capita for 1,000. There's no question there. Um, and one of the opportunities may be to assist um, law enforcement with budgetary requests. There may be also opportunities to provide grant funding. I don't know how often the AG's office does that with our law enforcement agencies. Obviously, the biggest thing will be your local jurisdictions, making sure that those agencies are well funded. And then when Washington State Patrol comes into it, making sure that the legislature has the appropriate budget for them. What I will note is in Pasco, we were very aggressive with our COVID funds. And so we actually made sure that our police and firefighters were staffed up. We also brought in some mental health professionals to work as what we call hot spotters, uh, so that if somebody's expen- experiencing a mental health crisis, the police aren't trained necessarily to do that. I mean, they have some training in that, but that's not their profession, right? And so I think there's a great opportunity to have those cross-sectional individuals who deal on a day-to-day who are professionally trained in mental health. So it's not just about putting a uniformed officer out there. It's about bringing in the additional resources like what we call our hot spotters to say, hey, look, there's a crisis here. If you come in, you're going to escalate it, not because you're bad at your job or because you're intentionally escalating it, but you don't have the tools or the resources or the training to make sure that you de-escalate. I mean, again, police are clearly trained in de-escalation, but they're not always trained in handling certain situations. So I would like to see not just more uniformed officers, uh, but I'd also like to see folks like our hotspotters who work hand in hand to really help de-escalate situations. Okay. What changes would you like to see be made to the AG's office? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's funny. Last night I was in a debate and they asked the question that I really got hung up on was what's one thing that happened, <clears throat> one case that Attorney General Ferguson has brought that that you disagree with? And I drew a blank and then, you know, about a minute later I was like, oh, hey, you know, the case with Value Village. And I think that was a, a preeminent example of where the attorney general seemed to really kind of dig in on a, a political bent. And so my goal is to represent the people fairly and adequately and accurately to always be focused on what your rights are and protect those rights, even when it maybe goes against, against the grain 
of, you know, even when I may personally disagree with it, you know, the AG's role should be blindfolded like Lady Justice, right? I use this analogy very often. That means that somebody intentionally placed that piece of cloth over her so that she could hear, so she could, you know, gather evidence from her her natural senses, not from her bias. And I want to make sure that the AG's office is not only walking kind of in concert with that, where we set our political biases aside, but we're also advising folks openly and transparency and transparently um we've seen the ag's office get hit with a couple of issues with evidence you know costing um costly awards where they didn't provide evidence in a timely fashion in litigation as well as their public records act um, when they're not openly and transparently providing those records to the public we're seeing fines being levied and those are taxpayer dollars, you know, and the taxpayers are those who are requesting these records. So I'm paying you to provide me with records that it, that really fundamentally should be mine objectively. And then and when you don't do that, you're also going to cost me even more money. So those are kind of where I'd like to see some real changes. Okay. Um, right now there are about 800 attorneys in the attorney general's office. Do you like that number? Would you like to increase it, decrease it? Um, you know, I don't know that it's the right number. I don't know that it's the wrong number. I certainly don't have an intent to increase it. Um, I've talked with uh, former At Attorney General McKenna. He said when he left 12 years ago, it was about half that. Now, I don't know that that's the right number either. I think the fundamental question, you know, things that people probably aren't aware of, there are 13 physical offices, and that ranges from Spokane, where we are, down to Pullman, up to Bellingham, all the way down to Clark County. So it's, you know, every corner of the state, there's one in Kennewick across the river for me. And so what I want to do, and I, I've told this to different folks, um, I, I don't know if I've rolled this out really uh, openly, I'd love to spend the first 26 weeks in office putting two weeks into each office, but one week kind of full week in and then move to an office and then come back at some point once I've hit all 13 and whether I do it, you know, in the same pattern or a randomized pattern, really understanding, do we need 800 attorneys general, assistant attorneys general? Do we need all the support staff? Um, I believe, just based on my personal experience, again, with the public records team, that they are probably understaffed there and they probably have a lack of technology. Um, I mean, when I submit, I have to submit a check and then I get a choice of a CD-ROM or a thumb drive. And it's just like, first, who has a CD-ROM anymore, right? And so um, for me, I really want to look at it. Uh, I suspect we could see some shrinkage in that, but I don't know that that's, again, I don't know. I, I, I've not been in that office. If elected, what would you do to address the growing problem of gun violence, particularly among children in the state? Yeah, you know, I think we need to make sure that our kids are held accountable, uh, and that's going to happen both in school systems. Uh, I was very concerned when I heard that King County was contemplating um, closing down its juvenile facility. We've got to make sure that these kids uh, have the ability to, when they do commit violent crimes, that they're held, they are held accountable, and part of that's going to be detention. But we also need to have some sort of diversion program for these kids. We can't just lock them up at 13 and say, you know, two days ago, uh, yeah, it was two days ago, uh, there were two instances where 13-year-old, your 13-year-olds were driving vehicles. They uh, intentionally caused a rear end, and then they carjacked someone with with firearms. One, a 13-year-old is not to be in possession of a firearm. That's not legal. Um, and so one of the things that we need to figure out is how do we actually get either the black market guns or illegal possession of firearms handled? And I don't have the answer for that. Uh, but what I do see is the attorney general has been sponsoring legislation that uh, takes the right of the individual to bear and carry firearms in the right of self-defense. It just flat out you know, it annuls that. It removes that opportunity. And, and that, to me, if my wife were to go out or if I were to go out and that were to happen to one of us and we don't have the right to protect ourselves anymore, that's highly problematic because these kids are going to do the same things regardless um, with no repercussions. So I do think working with children, I think 
working with the school systems uh, where possible to really provide those avenues for support for our kids, I think is really would be helpful. When I think about a 13 year old, I think about what the pandemic did to them. I think, you know, I, um, my kids are 11, nine and six. Uh, the one that was really impacted is my 11 year old. It's, it, there were some social changes, I think as well as some emotional changes just because there was such a lockdown, there was a disconnect. And so I think we owe our youth some sort of additional support. And so I, again, I think hopefully we find that in the education system. Um, but we need to provide activities, you know, different, different things for them to do to not be stuck in, you know, criminal activity. So you founded the Silent Majority Foundation, a nonprofit focused on gun rights advocacy. Could you talk a little bit about that work and how it kind of would play into your role as attorney general? Yeah. So let, let me correct you there. It's, it's focused on constitutional rights. You okay. know, our first cases were all um, individual freedom, freedom of choice, uh, religious freedoms, free speech. Uh, so we were primarily a First Amendment shop fundamentally. And then we rolled into bringing in a handful of firearms cases. And so we've got First and Second Amendment issues. Uh, we've actually looked at uh, jury trial issues. <laughs> um, so we've intentionally kept it broad so that when the next issue hits, we can be ready to respond to it. Um, you know, as to where that sits, you know, I've told folks this. When I'm elected, it's not going to be what does Pete Serrano say the Constitution says. I want, I really want this, and I mean this, I tell folks very often, I'd like a body, like kind of an executive team of maybe seven attorneys, a couple that agree with me, a couple that disagree with me on, on how to view the Constitution and case law that either supports or objects to a position, and then a couple in the middle. And I'd really like us to say, hey, look, you know, here, here's what the agency believes you know, about firearms, what the, the right to bear arms. Here's what the agency believes about where your religious uh, uh, free speech may or may not exist, right? There's been some very strong case law on each, you know, obviously uh, the Heller case being one of the firearms cases, you know, it's, now it's uh, about 10, 20 years old. Um, and then obviously the Bruin case, but we've also seen free speech cases, which have been very clear, you know, when you're inciting violence, that's not speech, right? And so I think there's there's great constitutional basis plus analysis from the Supreme Court of Washington and the United States that I think having kind of a, a constitutionally focused group where we're analyzing cases, oh, hey, there's a case that came out of Maryland, there's a case that came out of the U.S. Supreme Court, there's a case that came out of the Ninth Circuit. I think those types of updates are going to be critical moving forward on how the agency or the attorney general's office advises agencies and legislature. What do you think sets you apart from your opponent in this race? Yeah, um, I think we have very different views. Um, you know, I've I've held elected office. I was elected to the city of Pasco council. When I was in Pasco for two years, I moved up here nine years ago, and the people elected me as their representative. And then a couple of years ago, they reelected me. And then earlier this year, my peers, the city council members, elected me as mayor. I mean, so I've been entrusted kind of with the keys of the city, uh, both as a city council member as well as as the mayor currently. And so I think when you look at that, there's a there's a real strong community oriented value that I hold. And I'm not going to say Nick doesn't hold that. Um, but I think what just what separates us is my experience holding elected office. And he's consistently been appointed. He's worked for Jay Inslee as an appointment um, or a selection, if you will. And uh, by President Biden, the run the United States Attorney's Office uh, in the Western District. And so I think that's a strong distinction that uh, I'm not only someone who's held office, but been reelected to that same office. As we see the rise in artificial intelligence, how would you approach um, pushes to incorporate AI into policing, for example, traffic cameras and face recognition at the grocery store, et cetera? Yeah. So, you know, that's that was a hot button question in, in Pasco three 
three or four years ago because we decided to adopt a couple of red light cams. And we did so in the name of safety. And, you know, obviously the pandemic hit and traffic patterns were kind of dispersed differently because of that. People were driving less, et cetera. Uh, now that we've been full back for, I think, you know, a couple of years out of the pandemic, I keep asking our, our staff, all right, let's get that data mm -hmm. and see whether or not those red light cams are actually impacting, you know, because the notion was, hey, look, if you're these are your two intersections with the highest um, highest collision rate. And, you know, hopefully we'll see the result of those cameras is that the collision rate has decreased and the traffic volume has either increased or stayed the same. And so I think there's opportunity there. I, I have concerns with going, you know, too far. I mean, on the one hand, the AI opportunities are replete with providing additional public safety. Um, but I also believe there's a right to privacy. And there, that's a real interesting sticking point of where does the safety mechanism violate an individual's right to privacy? And um, I don't have that answer offhand. I do think that these are tools that need to be explored. Um, you know, fortunately, like in Pasco, our team um, wears body cams. You know, they've got dash cams. So there's opportunity to, you know, record as well as see live footage. So I think technology has been beneficial, but I'm not entirely certain where the thrust is of, you know, my right to privacy, you know, versus big brother, if you will. Earlier, you mentioned your views on constitutional analysis. Um, do you believe that the fact that abortion is encoded in, or the right to abortion access is encoded in state law, do you believe that that is constitutional? I so I believe that for me, I believe that there's a right to to life, you know, and that said, I don't believe that the state law necessarily violates constitutional principles. One of the things that I mentioned when I'm talking about abortion is when it was really when it kind of was protected in the 19, in 1970 or 71, that was done through a referendum, you know, which is the people's voice saying, we don't want this to have a, a criminal penalty. To me, I, I look at that as one of the most sacred tools that the people have to actually effectively legislate on their own, right? In Washington, our constitution provides the right to recall, recall a, a sitting officer, the right to a referendum again to change laws, and then the right to initiative to propose legislation or change laws as we've seen recently. What I would hate to do is be the guy that changed the voice of the people. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that the, that the law as it sits violates constitutional principles. I think there's this question of, you know, protecting life, liberty, and, you know, the pursuit of happiness. Um, so obviously there's a question of what the balance between abortion and protecting life is. Um, quite frankly, I've not had to be the one to wrestle with that, fortunately. And I do think that's something that's going to continually be a question, uh, before the support, before the Supreme Court eventually maybe getting down to that level of detail. But I, I don't necessarily think our current law violates constitutional principles. Okay. Last, or I guess earlier this year, there was a bill that failed in the state legislature that would have put kind of guardrails around potential hospital mergers. Um, I'm curious what your view on that would be and what guidance you would give that proposal. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have to look back at it. I read it. I've read some white papers on it. And some of the issues that I've seen are what the question that didn't seem to be well answered or articulated in the analysis is what happens to some of our more um, our more rural areas. You know, I mean, we're not too far from Ferry County, Ponderay County um, out here mm -hmm. in Spokane. We're not too far. Obviously, a lot of these are east side counties, right? Or But even like Cowlitz or Lewis County, if a consolidation needs to occur to provide additional resources to those um, communities, what's going to happen? And, you know, what if the AG disagrees with it, not based on legal principles, but rather personal views or political bent? Um, to me, that's that's extremely concerning. 
I do believe the Attorney General, through the Consumer Protection Act, has the tools at his fingertips to address mergers, to address acquisitions, to address services. So I'm not sure that having the bill was going to be a net benefit uh, to the people of Washington because I think it largely, again, really kind of um, forgot or ignored our rural areas. Okay. Let's see, I think I've asked so far most of all the questions that I had written down. I'm curious if there's anything I haven't asked about that you were hoping to bring up in this podcast. Um, I don't know that there's really anything that, that needs to be asked. I think, you know, Hopefully I've expressed my view that really fundamentally my goal here, uh, my objective as the future Attorney General of Washington is to make sure that people know they have a listening ear, that they have someone who's going to take the facts and the evidence and the law and apply it equally and fairly. And I think that's kind of the carriage of justice that's required. And I think it's a bit of the carriage of justice that's missing presently out of our Attorney General's office. And so... Um, I'm really looking forward to getting into that seat and, and working on behalf of the people. Well, on behalf of the newspaper and all our readers, we so appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about your campaign today. Hey, I really appreciate you inviting me here. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.